go. Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Krista Jack and I am the president of the Lakeville Area Chamber of Commerce and we're excited to have you here. This is our first uh, webinar of 2021. And just a reminder that this is a part of Real Time Solutions that is brought to you by the Apple Valley Burnsville, Hastings, Lakeville, and River Heights Chambers of Commerce. And the goal of these webinars since we started them last spring has always been to address our business concerns and questions as we continue to navigate not only through the pandemic, but now as we continue to work on recovery as well. And uh, we wanna give a special thank you to our first sponsor of 2021, Excel Energy is our uh, series sponsor. And um, Excel Energy has made a commitment to protecting the environment, embracing clean energy technology, and standing with our communities to shape the future and they've been very supportive of our chambers and our business community and so thank you to Excel for being a sponsor. And just a reminder for those that are watching with us live this morning, this is being recorded and um, you will be able to ask Laura any questions. Laura has told me she loves conversation so please feel free as you have conversations to put them in the chat and we will address those as we go through. And so again, as I said, we're excited. Uh, we've got Laura Bordelon here with us today. And Laura is a Senior Vice President for Advocacy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And Laura has been there since 2011. So you've, you, you're coming up on 10 years this year, right, Laura? That's amazing. Uh, she leads the organization's public policy, grassroots, and political engagement strategies. And um, you've got quite a background. And I don't know if part of your presentation was to go through your background, Laura. So I I was going to go through some key points. Were you going to touch on it at all? Nope. Okay, then I'm going <laughs> to touch on it, it a little bit. Um, she directed the Minnesota Chamber's education, telecommunications, and energy policy from 2000 to 2004. She was a policy director for Governor Tim Pawlenty from um, 04 to 05, and then was named the director of legislative and cabinet affairs in 06. Uh, and she was recently uh, a director of corporate state government affairs for Medtronic. So you've been um, uh, seen several sides of it. Uh, she's got a bachelor from the U of M and um, she's a board member, board member for the Minnesota Government Relations Council and right here at uh, our Dakota County, Minnesota Zoo, correct? So um, we've got that connection. And so Laura is here today and she is gonna talk to us about um, the Minnesota Chamber's session priorities, what they're gonna be working on on behalf of businesses here um, this session. So Laura, I am excited. I've talked long enough. I think it's time to turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Um, Thank you, Krista. <laughs> Great. Um, good morning, everybody. And I'm, I'm really, I'm grateful for the invitation to join all of you. I'm going to try to, oops, it looks like Krista, I can't do my oh, um, let me, yep. screen share. I have, I have a couple of slides. I'm not going to, we're not going to do a march through a PowerPoint this morning, but it's a, a helpful way yeah. of um, sharing some of the, some of the thoughts on uh, our session priorities and kind of what's gonna be happening at the Capitol. So let me see if I can get this set up so everyone can see it appropriately. Looks good? Looks good. Okay, great. So, you know, one of the things that I wanna convey to you is, is this, you know, we're gonna have this big busy session. There are all of these issues swirling around and you can see some of those items in gray. So public safety is gonna be a hot topic again, paid leave, especially in the context of you know, quarantining and um, taking care of others during the pandemic, liability protections, broadband, workplace mandates, healthcare, election integrity, climate change, school funding, it goes on and on. There's a lot of issues that have been surfaced by the pandemic, but also just things that a lot of different um, interest groups wanna see passed. But really what it boils down to in the 2021 session for the legislature is two jobs. Job one, is to balance and enact a state budget. Uh, they, have a, they have a hard deadline of June 30th to get this done. And as you probably remember from previous years, uh, if the state doesn't have a balanced budget by that deadline, state programs shut down. So it's a, it's a hard stop. They have to get this done. Uh, and the other thing is to manage continued impacts from COVID-19. These things keep rolling forward. Um, so for example, who's gonna get vaccinated and when? That is a state decision. Um, how are employers gonna, gonna engage in vaccinating employees if, if they choose to do so? Um, what, what's going on with our public health needs? Do we need to provide more support for the hospitals if there's another surge? So to me, these are the two big issues um, for the legislature to, to wrestle with and deal with this session. As I mentioned, this is a, this is a state budget year. And we've had an interesting forecast. Um, unusually last May, 
the state did a budget update and it was all over the place. It was a pretty unpredictable time. We really didn't know exactly what the pandemic was gonna to do to the economy. And obviously, as all of you know, since then, we've had several pauses and shutdowns to business activity. And then there's a kind of a public sector or public services response that's going on at the same time. And all of these things have been um, reconsidered in the most recent November budget forecast. And there's kind of a good news piece and a, and a bad news piece. The good news piece is that there's a surplus for the current budget year. Why is that? Um, part of the reason is the COVID impact has been less than anticipated, good news. Um, there's been a $1 billion decline in spending. There's been a $1.9 billion increase in revenues, which I think was a bit of a surprise for the state budget forecasters. People are spending money. They're spending their stimulus checks on everything from fire pits, patio furniture, new washers and dryers, home office stuff. So people are, are still consuming and spending. But a very worrisome um, note on this forecast is uh, half of the jobs that were lost at the beginning of the pandemic have been gained but we have a large number of people who have exited the workforce. So that, that's a particular thing we're keeping our eye on and, and we're concerned about. Here's the bad news piece. Um, so the budget forecast for the, for the next two years of the cycles, they project over a two year horizon, um, is out of whack. There's a deficit. Why? Spending growth is outpacing revenue growth. Our spending growth was up 7.3%. Our revenue growth was only up 6.4% thus the, the deficit. So where was that spending accelerating? It was in the health and human services sector. So that's all the social service programs, public health, um, uh, support for food, for housing, all of those kind of safety net programs. And then 20% from uh, the E12 budget, which is early education all the way to high school. The other important note is that uh, inflation is not included in this forecast. So if you included the 1.3 billion in inflation, um, that deficit would be even larger. So we have a big deficit we, the, the legislature is gonna need to deal with. Unlike Congress, they have to settle this out. So they have to either raise taxes, cut spending. Um, there are some other ways of solving the budget, budget deficit. Some of that's gonna depend on if the federal government um, sends more money to the states. And it also might depend on if the, if the legislature wants to look into some of uh, timing payments. This is a tool that's been used in the past. They can also tap into the budget reserves. So while that number seems a little daunting, they do have some tools and some ways of uh, resolving that deficit. Can we jump back really quick, Laura? Um, we've got a question that came in on the, I think it's slightly before this when you talked about a, the billion less in spending. Um, mm -hmm. a question asked why, what, what did it cost for that decrease? Was it agency staff? What, what was the decrease in spending? It's a combination of things. So there are less kids enrolled in the school system. Some people held their kindergartners back or some people decided to homeschool. Um, some of the HHS programs were tapped a little less. Um, it's, it's a just kind of a general decline in spending. I don't think it was from agency cuts. I, I don't know that agency cuts have been made at all. I just think overall spending has decreased um, because, of, because of the impact of the pandemic. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so let's, I wanna talk a little bit about the politics of all of this because it matters. Um, you know, who's in charge, who's sitting in the leadership, all of this matters um, on, the, on the results of, the, of this session. One of the big items is the governor's reelection. I know we just finished an election cycle and it still feels like we're in it. Um, but this is a big moment for, for Governor Walz. He's had a couple of incredible challenges during his first couple of years. Um, he will be judged on his leadership during the pandemic. A lot of people are not happy about all the executive orders and the shutdowns. The civil unrest that we all experienced last summer, um, that is something that is, you know, as leader of the state, he's gonna be asked to um, reckon with or describe. And then also, uh, you know, how, how we've managed, uh, managed the pandemic. The dynamic, <coughs> excuse me, um, with the legislature is the House is controlled by Democrats and they tend to align with the governor and help advance his agenda. The Senate, which is um, controlled by Republicans, tends to have the, the opposing view or the loyal opposition. We are still, we were over the last couple of years and we are still the only state legislature in the entire country that's split. It's just a remarkable thing. And we think it's a good thing. We think it forces compromise and working together. And we've had some really good results from this kind of split political um, sharing of the, of the legislature. The other thing that was interesting from the previous election is their slimmer legislative majorities. So 
the House Democrat majority is smaller. The Senate Republican majority is different and smaller. Um, and I'll get to that in the next bullet point, which is there are factions now within the caucuses. I don't know if any of you saw the news um, a couple of months ago, but two longtime Iron Range Democrats, uh, Senator Tom Bach, well known around the Capitol, and Senator David Tomasoni, both from the Iron Range, um, left the Democrat Party and became independents. Um, there are also a group of, of Republicans in the Minnesota House Republican delegation that call themselves the New Republicans, and they caucus separately from the rest of the Republicans. And there's also two new senators who um, are, are supported by the Democrat Socialist Party. One is from Duluth and the other is from Minneapolis. So that's a whole nother dynamic going on within the legislature. Very interesting political change um, with the legislature this year. And then the other thing, just to ratchet up the politics even more, is this is a redistricting um, time. Every 10 years, as you probably know, we do a census. And based on the census count, new political lines are drawn, not just for the legislature, but also for congressional members. This is a big deal. You know, some people end up nested together. That's a really tough situation. Um, if their neighbors and their districts become overlap, then some, it's like, like musical chairs. Somebody um, misses a seat. So this is, you know, I know we talk about politics all the time, but it really does impact um, discussions and negotiations at the Capitol. And we as a state, I believe, did fairly well in our in the census, did we not, in terms of response rate in that? We are overachievers. Yeah, it's just like voting. You know, people, people are really good about um, providing information. There's been a lot of speculation, Krista, about if we're going to lose a congressional seat. It's a lot of talk this year. Our population, it's not so much that our population has be, been declining so fast. It's that southern sunbelt states their population is increasing so fast. So Florida, Texas, um, Georgia, those, those, seat, those states will probably pick up a congressional seat. Um, California and New York, they're talking about losing congressional seats for the first time. It's, it's gonna be an absolutely fascinating um, change really in not only congressional power, but, but for our state. It's a, I don't think it's a good thing to lose a congressional seat. So we'll see how it plays out. I'm hoping we don't, but there's a lot of speculation we will. So, so Minnesotans, okay. stop moving south. Is that the message there? Right. Stay here. We need you. We need you for workforce reasons. Right. We need too. you in our economy. True. So I want to talk a little bit about the Chamber's priorities. That was our focus. And, I'm, I'm, you know, I think we're being very practical with this legislative session. We're not coming to the legislature with an incredibly long laundry list. We're really focused on leading uh, Minnesota to an economic recovery. As you all know, um, especially if you're in the hospitality industry, in any type of very uh, consumer-facing industry, this has been a rough road with the pandemic. Um, so one of our goals is to make sure that hard-hit industries, so this would include event centers, the zoo, those type of you know, places where people like to gather, are helped um, with immediate cash flow through either tax relief or small business assistance. Uh, if, you, if you aren't aware, the state has grants available, uh, not loans, which I know businesses who have been um, really challenged in this time, they don't wanna take on more debt and that's completely understandable. They need cash. So there's a state-based program and there's also a county-based program. So if I, I would encourage you strongly to talk to your counties, to talk to your local chambers about helping get assistance through these county grants. They're larger, they're more flexible and they might be able to help you um, at a really key time with cash flow. So the other issue with this kind of cash flow consideration for us is the federal government made the Paycheck Protection Program loans forgivable. But what we need to do at the state level is make sure they're not taxable. And that requires legislative action by the state. So we're pushing already to talk with the legislature and with the governor about making sure those PPP loans are not taxable and that um, expensing is the same as what's done on the federal level. We call that conformity. The other um, issue, so that's immediate. It's just keep business as stabilized as possible and get them as much assistance as possible. And do you, and Laura, just to stay on that for one second, that for the PPP conformity, what, what is your opinion? Do you think that's something that um, will most likely pass or is that gonna be a, a long road ahead? Our experience with any tax bill in the legislature is you gotta work really hard to get it. Um, it is not a given 
it might seem completely practical to business owners. Um, taxes is really tough at the legislature. I think uh, legislators have a tough time um, with giving tax breaks to businesses, even in these circumstances. So we will need your help in making sure we're talking to the legislature and governor about getting that done. Otherwise, these forgivable loans will be taxable in Minnesota, which is just not helpful. Yeah, right. not helpful at all. Um, I think we've all learned the value and importance of good broadband connectivity. Um, we want to make sure to maintain and enhance that since so many people are learning and working and getting healthcare delivery um, through internet now. So that's, that's something we've got our eye on. It's also a really great way of uh, using one-time dollars. You know, you can make a big infusion of assistance and then not have it be a legacy item like so many programs are. And legacy, I mean just long-term commitment. The other piece is reorienting, reorienting workforce development programs based on needs. Our workforce training programs are pretty clunky. They're hard, to, they're hard to move forward quickly. They're hard to make sure they're meeting market needs. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking with the legislature about making sure uh, businesses have the employers they need. And part of that is might be recognizing workplace training. It might be shortening up some certification programs. Those are the kind of ideas that we have. The other piece, and Chris and I were laughing about this earlier, is got to get our kids back in school. It is a workforce issue. It is really tough. I have a couple of staff people with um, K-6 kids, and the amount of juggling they're doing between teaching and monitoring kids' work during the day and working for the chamber is really hard. And we've heard it from a lot of employers. It's, it's really tough on productivity, and they're getting emails from their employees at 11 o'clock at night when they finally have time to work. So we are very anxious to get kids back in school and not lose more, lose more time um, in-person learning. It's really important. The other piece that we've heard all over the state, not just Metro, but in greater Minnesota too, is the childcare system is, is really struggling. It has been for a while. The pandemic has made it that much harder. People are either pulling kids out or um, you know, uh, frontline workers get, get places first. So our childcare shortage has just gotten that much tougher. We wanna make sure we're supporting um, the providers and the facilities so that um, workers and, and parents have a place, a safe place for the kids to go during the day. The other thing, and I will admit to you, I think this unfortunately might be a long stretch, is making sure that we enact COVID lawsuit protections. So if you have pivoted your manufacturing to provide um, PPE or sanitizer or some other thing, we want to make sure that you are not um, sued and then there's not a problem for you. The um, trial bar in Minnesota is very active, and we think this is going to be hard to do, but we'll make the case that um, businesses tried to step up and do the right thing and be helpful at a time when all of us really needed it. So these are additional priorities. We, we keep these in our sites all the time, and, and I would say, Krista, and, and to the folks on the call, we consider these do-no-harm strategies, right? We've talked a lot about um, the legislature's interest and even local government's interest in dictating to private sector employers what their benefits should be. And it's everything from uh, wages to paid time off, scheduling. I mean, imagine what a nightmare scheduling would be during a pandemic. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of movement and energy, um, frankly, in more liberal states, California, Washington, New York, Washington, DC. Um, there's a, a lot of these things are being passed. Massachusetts paid a huge, uh, passed a huge paid family leave program that they took two years to resolve the rulemaking on. Um, these are very complicated ideas and programs. Um, and we would prefer to have employers design their benefit sets for their industry and for their employees. That uh, just seems completely sensible to us. Um, the other piece that we always keep an eye on is maintaining access to high quality, affordable health care. Um, it's a benefit a lot of employees want to provide if they're not, or to continue to provide. Um, it's a talent retention issue, and we've got to make it as affordable for employers to provide to their employees as possible. Um, there's all kinds of ideas that pop up on mandates. Um, we'll have a big battle this year about a reinsurance program that helps keep rates down in the individual market versus a public option. Um, so that'll be back this session. And the other piece is to promote cost efficient, efficient energy and sustainability, climate, energy prices. These are becoming very big issues for the state. I think we'll probably see a lot of activity at the federal level on this. We don't want Minnesota to be out of step 
with, um, with federal initiatives. And we also want to recognize the fact that so many businesses, Excel is a great example, are really doing wonderful things um, for our environment without mandates. Mandates tend to you know, be one size fits all and they, make, um, they take away a lot of innovation and a lot of uh, cost effectiveness. So we want to make sure we keep on the path of allowing um, uh, businesses to pursue and, and achieve their sustainability goals without a big uh, state mandate coming their way. So with that, Krista, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about anything going on in this session. Absolutely. So I've got some, yes. And just a reminder, if you've got some questions, we've got Laura for a few more minutes. So put them in the chat. Um, Laura, we have a question of, do you think the legislature will be able to get the governor to give up or modify his emergency powers? Boy, you know, we've, this has been such a hot debate um, ever since he enacted emergency powers. So uh, having worked in a governor's office, I can tell you, um, I think it's very unlikely that he'll agree to it. Uh, I will say, you know, emergency powers have been preserved for these very unique situations. So um, when I worked for Governor Pawlenty, there were floods and tornadoes, and we used the emergency powers to quickly deploy resources to places if the legislature wasn't in session, or to access federal dollars in a very fast way. I know this is an unusual circumstance. The legislature is in, in session full-time until May. Um, I think it would be wise for the governor to do as much of this decision-making sharing as possible uh, but what I've heard from the legislative leadership um, presentations is, you know, they're not likely to do it. One of the requirements the governor is saying is, you know, I'll give up my emergency powers if you, you know, if you agree to a mask mandate. Well, a lot of people have feelings about a mask mandate. So I, I see it continuing, although I, I think the governor is, is very smart and I think he's going to, um, try to try to engage more with the legislature than when they were out of session. Okay. All right. Great. We have another question that says, um, what type of impact do you expect takeaways uh, from navigating the pandemic might have on paid sick leave efforts? Yeah, um, I, I expect it to be um, a, a more compelling argument, to be honest with you, um, especially for lower wage frontline workers. They, uh, they don't have this benefit. There's a lot of folks that have a PTO style benefit that they can access. And if you think about some of the quarantine requirements. So if you're supposed to quarantine for seven to 10 days, and I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember what the threshold is now because they've changed it recently. Yeah, right. But if you're supposed to stay away from work for 10 days, um, you know, you, you need to be able to, to just not have your income stop. Um, I, think, I think it's gonna be tougher for us to make that case, but at the same time, um, you know, a state-based program is really, is really big and cumbersome. The program that they um, advocated for last the past two years was so expensive. It was a payroll tax only on employers, not on employees. Um, it was effective immediately when you came to work. So there wasn't even a kind of, you work for three months, you know, the standard period of time when you toll to get benefits, it was immediate. Um, it had a number of problems, uh, not the least of which a huge state insurance claim system and process would have to be set up to process these things. So um, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a timely question. And I think we're going to wrestle with it a lot this session. I'm not sure some of the proposals we've seen are the solution. So we will likely keep advocating for uh, employers to be able to provide benefits on their own. The challenge is when, um, like small and mid-sized companies, when they can't afford to what those employees do. So it's a, it's a hard topic. I'm not sure we've, landed, we've all landed on the exact right answer yet. Sure, sure. So another question too that, that ties into the priorities, uh, kind of the workforce and, and, you know, obviously education, how, you know, bringing our kids back um, ties into that. We've had a lot of conversations here in Dakota County about, you know, when, when the $600 was in place last year and, and kind of even talking to, to career force and, and through our chambers, we thought, okay, as soon as, as soon as that $600 goes away, we're going to see people applying for jobs like crazy. And I, I think we all braced for something that didn't happen. And so the conversations since then have been, well, well, what has, you know, what happened? Why haven't, you know, we have manufacturers and, and I'm sure you see it all over the state who are saying, I, I would hire, I, I've got 20 open positions, send them my way. And, and we're just not seeing that. We're not seeing the folks that have been furloughed or displaced um, looking for an employment elsewhere. And, you know, and I, I we've had employment agencies say, I, I go to sleep every night with 125 jobs open that I can't fill. 
how do we bridge that gap? Are you guys seeing anything in other areas or, or, or what do you see from the Minnesota Chamber standpoint? It's, it's a head scratcher and it's been this way for a long time, Krista. I mean, this isn't, our workforce problem is, is, is the same. It's just amazing to me. You know, we heard, I think 12 years ago during the, during the last great recession that employers couldn't find employees. Um, I don't know. I really don't know why. I don't know if there's, there's a, a benefit, a greater benefit to staying home than going through a training program or, or getting a certification and going to work. Um, it's, it's, it's a head scratcher to be really honest with you. And, and so many businesses are having this problem. In fact, we, you know, we had lengthy conversations with Commissioner Grove at the Department of Economic Development and the legislature about be very careful about extending unemployment benefits because we, you know, we, we have a lot of members who are looking for workers. Um, you know, you, you want to be sensitive to, to the challenges families are facing around the holidays with um, furloughing, and, but at the same time, there's jobs available. So I don't have a good answer for you, Krista. I think we're still trying to figure it out, too. But um, our members are saying they're hiring and they need people. And right. um, that, that first slide that I showed on the, on, the, on the budget forecast, that showed 107,000 people not coming back. Uh, very concerning, very troubling, and it's going to affect our economic growth. So we need to we need to get after that and get that sorted out for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and I want to be respectful of your time too. We're getting close, but we do have another question. Um, what role has the Minnesota Chamber played in getting exceptions or changes to the executive order? And this person was giving the example of um, theaters being allowed at twenty five percent capacity. Um, and then you know when he changed the EO, he specifically changed theaters to going to a you know a different cap. Um, do you guys have any ability to, to affect any of that change? Well, we try, you know, um, I will tell you the administration is really good about reaching out to us and, and talking about some of this stuff. They, they're very polite in giving us a heads up. Um, we do engage with them, um, at times with some of these things, we pushed really, really hard on the small business grants and reopening the economy. And for us, you know, we're always balancing and I think you all are doing the same thing. We want to protect public health, but we want businesses open. And we keep hammering it and pushing it. Um, you know, they don't ask us <laughs> what, what we think they should include in their EOs. Um, I was relieved that he began to open things up, uh, but we sure wish it would accelerate. It's, um, you know, it, it's hard to wait for the vaccine to make it all okay to resume to normal business. But, I, you know, we've got to control hospital capacity, and I think that was his concern the last time. So we do try to weigh in. Um, we definitely share our thoughts and views with the administration all the time. Um, but they say they are guided by public health metrics and that's how they make their decisions. It's as frustrating as it is for all of us. It's a, we are hopeful to get open fully as soon as possible. Okay, very good. Um, I do have another question came through about um, when you were talking about the child care system. They're yeah. wondering if you're referring to private business, state run, or both. All of it. You know, this is this model is so challenged. It's expensive. Uh, the people who run it have heavy regulatory burdens. It's expensive for them to run it, so they're you know they're asking their customers to pay a high cost. Um, it's something we need for workforce purposes. We support all of the private sector uh, childcare facilities. Uh, I think when Governor Dayton, I don't know if you remember this, he attempted to unionize. The workers that sent a chill across the industry, uh, and then you allowed, I think, four-year-olds to opt into um, either kindergarten or early early learning programs. I mean, these are really really tough for a market-based model. So um, we're really concerned about making sure there's enough capacity across all the system. We would love to explore ideas like providing an incentive for employers to share space or um, contract with, with child care facilities. Some can. I know in greater Minnesota, there have been a couple who have used an old church or an old or a uh, unused part of a YMCA. So we want to, we want to look at these models and, and make sure there's more slots available for everybody. It's, it is a, it's a big problem. Our, of course, we prefer private sector approach, but um, we're at the point where, where we just, we need spots for kids. That's great. Well, we are, Laura, we are coming up on time. We may have even got a little bit over on time. Um, I see you, you've got your email address in there, so that's wonderful. And, and so please, obviously, if you have questions that, that you think of afterwards and you want to reach out to Laura, 
or certainly reach out to one of us at your local chamber and we can certainly pass that along. And, and I certainly can, I mean, speak on, you know, I think behalf of the group that Minnesota Chamber has been so great to work with. Obviously we are members of the chamber and you guys are so responsive. And, and as you know, our members come to us and, and want things communicated at the state level, your staffs have been, uh, like I said, so great at, at making that, um, making sure that, that we feel that our voices are heard and that we know that you're working on our behalf. So I wanna thank you so much for that. I wanna thank you for your time. I think this was great information. Um, and, and we're so excited to have this. And, and so again, um, just a reminder, if, if you still have questions, please reach out to Laura, reach out to your local chambers. Uh, I do wanna give another special um, shout out and a thank you to Excel Energy, our series sponsor. And, uh, and just remind everyone that this is a series of webinars that's brought to you by the Apple Valley, Burnsville, Hastings, Lakeville and River Heights chambers. And, and we started these back in uh, 2020 and we're gonna continue them in 21. We're gonna, we're gonna change it up a little bit. Uh, we're gonna do this format in, in kind of this uh, webinar our format that we did last year once a month and then um, a second time a month we are going to do something that's a little bit more interactive and give people yeah I think Laura and I were talking about this people are ready to get back and and see each other and talk to each other and so we want to give you guys an opportunity to uh, to kind of network while you're a part of these so uh, the the first one of that is going to be on Wednesday January 27th it's going to be from 8 to 9 a.m. we are going to have motivational speaker Annie Meehan with us and she is going to talk to us about how to be the exception kind of how to to stand out and um, there's going to be an interactive component so watch your local chamber of commerce as to how to sign up for that one and and we're excited to kind of be changing up the format um, I, I hate to use the word pivot but Laura that's I think that's right the the term we're, we're pivoting and we're, we're changing as we go so um, and again if there's topics that you want to hear about please make sure you're reaching out to your local chamber and letting us know and uh, and we'll work on those so again Laura I can't thank you enough for taking the time with us here this morning and, and thank everyone for listening and everyone um, who will watch this afterwards. Uh, thank you and have a wonderful day. Take Thanks care, Laura. Good luck Thanks to your everyone. son. <laughs> thank you. Great talking with you. Thank you. All right. Goodbye.